I took a sip of my whiskey sour, sat back, and observed. This case was about par for me these days. The music reminded me of better times that were also worst times. Philip and I were great together. We'd been together since high school, and it was fire and passion. And then it stopped. We'd been each other's first in so many ways. I moved into my grandparents' attic apartment because Grandpa died and Grandma refused to move. I became the compromise. Philip almost moved in with me. Then came the ugly breakup. His family was rich, as in eight digits kind of rich. As soon as his parents found out about how middle class my family was, they gave Philip a choice. Either Philip stayed with me, and he lost out on his inheritance and allowance, or they shipped Philip off to the Marines to be an officer, maybe to go career like his father. Then they would arrange for him to be married to a nice girl from a rich family, and he'd give them grandkids. He'd also inherit millions and keep his allowance. Philip chose the money over the love we had. I was thrown out like yesterday's smelly trash. I suddenly stopped believing in romance. That was four years ago. I had barely turned twenty then, and I just barely turned twenty-four now. Life has moved on for me, but the little I heard about Philip, his life went exactly as his parents planned. Love is a myth. I'm not asexual. I'm very into guys, but the long-term commitments you see on TV are just fantasy. I'd had lovers that lasted a whole weekend, but no real boyfriend since Philip. I didn't see the point. I got a degree in criminology took care of Grandma, and am in the process of starting my own detective agency. I am cheap, not quite broke, and blessedly single. I sat in the exclusive club, the Black Orchid Club, a nondescript place located about a mile from the Vegas Strip, and listened to my target. The band, Milwaukee Nights, made up of friends who had been playing together for years, commanded the stage. Sultry jazz filled the air, and another man prepared to play the saxophone. He's my target. He nodded his head once, twice, thrice, put his lips on the mouthpiece, waited for the proper second, and played like an angel. A smooth, mellow sound came from the flared bell of the saxophone. His fingers moved across the body of the instrument, gently touching the keypads. The melody was pure and full of a dark promise suggesting midnight lust. Before tonight, I had never seen him before. I closed my eyes and for a moment forgot the ugliness of my life and the ugliness his was about to turn into. He wore a dark burgundy long sleeve button down shirt that shimmered in the dim lights and dark khaki chinos and black and gray two-tone slip-on shoes. Draped over the back of his chair was a dark brown tweed jacket. Around his neck was a thread-thin silver chain. His brown, straight hair hung just past his shoulders, but was pulled into a neat ponytail. Two hoops hung from each ear. A narrow face with high cheekbones, he seemed to smile at everything. Whenever he wasn't playing the saxophone, he seemed delighted to get into a conversation with anyone. Zion reminded me of the man I used to be before life made me a cynic. Long, delicate fingers worked the saxophone, bringing it to life. This man knew how to play. The song he played was beautiful, a little bit erotic, maybe a little lonely. The audience loved him, and not because he was handsome. If our roles had been different, I would ask him out. He'd say no, because any man or woman would love to hang out with him. The man was styled with a saxophone. Me, I wore a clean light shirt, but it was inundated with wrinkles. I wore nice slacks, but today was the third day in a row I wore them. In an attempt to be stylish, 
I wore a fluorescent green skinny tie. It did have a small ketchup stain near the end. Usually, I like to wear the tie tight to my neck, but I was tired right now, so the top two buttons of my shirt were undone, and the tie hung about my loose collar. My jacket was almost as wrinkled as my shirt. I admit it, a pet gopher irons better than me. According to the bio, the man who played was named Zion Mancusi. He had turned 21 almost six months ago, had ended his last relationship two months ago, and he studied music at UNLV. But with the way he played, he was a professional already. I'm also a professional. At least I'm trying to be. But I don't play music. But I do appreciate those that do. Those men that do. I've been contracted to find Zion Mangusi. I'm gay, and I find him hot as hell. The first part of the job was finding him, and I'd been paid well for that. I mentally checked that item off the to-do list. I sipped my whiskey sour, enjoying the smooth, silky taste. The bartenders here were worth their salary. Two men and a woman entered the club, the men wearing suits, the woman wearing a practical dress and practical heels. The slight bulge in one guy's jacket suggested he kept a 9mm in a shoulder holster. The other man fiddled at his bag. I bet he had a surprise tucked in the small of his back, one that I wouldn't like. But I was also ready. Beneath my jacket, I wore a standard shoulder holster with the gun slightly below my heart. My trusty old Glock 32, a 357 caliber with nine shots. I had two spare clips currently on the right side of my shoulder holster. I did have a concealed weapon permit, and I had trained since middle school about how to shoot. Grandpa, God rest his soul, saw to that. The man with the suspected shoulder holster quickly glanced over the room, his eyes quickly ignoring every man older than 24 and pausing on every man younger than 24. For a second, his eyes focused on me. I ignored him and took a sip of my drink. His eyes moved on. Evidently, he didn't know what his target looked like, or he was working from an old yearbook photo. It pays to do your homework. The woman carried a small handbag, but it carried something weighty. Another 9 millimeter, perhaps? Damn, I thought I had more time, but I had underestimated how much these guys wanted Zion. Zion didn't even know the trouble he was in. My job became trickier. How to keep him breathing long enough to get him to safety? If I told him about the danger, would he freak and make my job even harder? Zion finished his solo, and then the jazz band finished their set. The lead guitarist took the microphone and said, Time for a break, ladies and gentlemen. We will be back in 15. Now's my time, and I don't have much. I walked over to the band, to Zion actually, bringing my whiskey sour with me. Random introductions were the tricky part of the job. Random introductions with mysterious gunmen watching could get trickier. Who knew how Zion would react? especially when told the truth. Nice job on the sax, I said. That's quite the gifted set of fingers. Zion set the saxophone on a special stand and said, Thanks. You wouldn't think it a gift if you practiced four hours every day. Do I detect a little bitterness? I asked. Zion stood, looking at me with a gaze that seemed to look inside me. The man said, Every gift has a price. Mine is daily practice. And you are? Marcus Smith, I said. According to the billing, you are the talented Zion Mancusi. Can I buy you a drink? They make a great whiskey sour here. They don't use any of that store-bought lemon juice, but use real lemons for both the juice and the zest. Sorry, Zion said. I don't drink alcohol when I'm performing. It can throw me off. No problem, I said and led Zion to the table reserved only for the band. 
I made sure to block the view of the newcomers as I waved to the bartender and said, Bartender, another whiskey sour for me and a virgin sour for my friend. Put them on my tab and a pepperoni pizza. We need to hurry before the band goes back on stage. The bubbly bartender, a girl in her early twenties, nodded, gave me a smile, and said, Bumped to the head of the line. She should. I paid her a greenback before the night started and told her to keep the drinks coming. And whatever I don't use is her tip. So far, my tab had only one whiskey sour on it. Zion and I made small talk until the drinks arrived. And then I said, As much as I wish I was here on pleasure, this is business. Zion held his drink, but didn't take a sip, and said, What do you mean? Both of the men were walking around the tables, looking at people. One of them kept looking at a picture on his phone. The woman sat at the bar, surveying everybody who walked past her. Time was up. The club had the obvious entrance, and I'd bet a less obvious entrance in the back. The man looking at his phone approached our table. I need to make this fast. Zion, how about we go back to my place right now? Zion took a quick gulp of his drink, almost chuckled, and said, You're not subtle. Your pickup line needs some work. I'm flattered, but I can't. Break is over in fifteen, and then it's back on stage until closing. I took a deep breath to steady my nerves, felt my heart rate go up, and my blood pressure. One of the men was getting close to our table. I had to hide Zion's face for a few seconds. This either would work, or it would be a huge disaster. I glanced at the man coming closer. It was the one with the suspected pistol hidden in the small of his back. We had seconds. I didn't have any other choice, so I softly ordered, I don't have time to explain, so you'll have to trust me. Kiss me, now. Your life depends on it. What? I don't even know you, Zion said. Kiss me. You're in danger, I ordered, my eyes flickering to the approaching man. Zion noticed who I looked at. Though he was a little unsure, Zion leaned over and kissed me like we were old lovers. Zion was experienced. To others, it might seem a mere pressing of the lips. To others, it might seem a little thing. To me, it wasn't a little thing. It was enough to make fireworks shoot out of my ears, metaphorically speaking. It also meant that Zion's face was shielded by mine, and the people after him couldn't find him. The gunman stood next to us. Two men kissing in front of him made him uncomfortable. He turned away, revealing his back. I was right. The small lump told me he did have something lodged in the small of his back. The kiss bought us a few seconds. After the guy walked past us, Zion and I separated. Only then did Zion get a good look at the man and the other man wandering the crowd. Once again, Zion leaned in close, but this time he whispered, What's going on? Before I could answer, the bubbly bartender returned and said, Zion, some woman is asking about you. What did you say? I asked. I didn't know what to say, so I told her I'd check with the band, she said. Those are not nice people. Zion, you've got to get out of here, I said. Zion quickly pointed to what I assumed was the rear exit and replied, Dad's done it again, hasn't he? Tell the lady I went out to the alley to take a private phone call. Tell my friends to watch over my sacks and I'll call them later. Right, the bubbly bartender said. The ploy worked. The bartender told the woman, who told the two gentlemen, who went out back. Once they had left, Zion and I ran out front. The bartender handed us our pizza to go. The lady at the bar noticed us and sent a quick text. After cracking open the door a few inches, I checked to make sure there wasn't somebody else out there. I didn't spot anybody. Zion and I ran, heading for my car. Unfortunately, it was a block away. Zion kept up with me and finally asked, What's going on? Did you know your dad had a gambling problem? I replied. Last time I saw him, he promised he'd stopped. 
Zion said. He didn't stop, did he? Were those people his bookies? Is Dad trying to borrow money from me again? That's why I cut contact. The answer is always no. My car was clear. I unlocked it and we climbed in, and then I said, I wish it was that simple. Your dad borrowed money from some pretty shady people so he could make that big score and pay everybody he owes back all at once. Think of these guys as the corner loan store, but without the store, and they have worse interest rates. They are not nice. Okay, Zion said. What does that have to do with me? I started the car and drove away. One of the men came out of a nearby alley and was speaking on his phone. Get down, I said. Zion ducked. The guy glanced at us, but seeing only one person in the car, he didn't give us a second thought. We turned a corner, and I said, it's clear. Zion sat up, quickly buckling his seatbelt, and asked, why are they looking for me when it's my dad who borrowed the money? I don't know all the details, so you'll have to call him, I said. Zion gave me a small, nervous smile, but there wasn't anything humorous about it. He quietly said, I'm not giving him a loan to solve all his problems. I don't have the money. Your dad's scum. Old story, I said. Your dad's gone into hiding, and for some reason they're looking for you. Your dad is the one who hired me. Why? Zion asked. I'm cheap, I said. And he wants me to protect you from them? What if dad can't get the money? Zion asked. They'll find a way to get it out of him, I said. Or it's the classic skin-tight, wire-thin neck chain followed by a quick burial in the middle of the Moavi. They'd kill him? They'd kill me? He asked. Interest rates are high, I said. How much does dad owe? Zion asked. High five figures, I said, but it's closer to six. Zion went quiet a moment and then said, Do these guys expect me to have that kind of money? Are they stupid? No. I said. They're businessmen who want their money back. I can't believe this is happening, Zion said. Zion slowly shook his head and then stared out the window. He finally said, Dad and I were never close. I was a junior in high school working at the car wash on Levitt Street when I let Dad talk me into giving him my first paycheck. I never saw that money again. I drove. Zion had a serious problem and I couldn't see a way out of it. His next question brought me back to reality. Are you a private detective or something? He asked. Yes, I am, I said. You're my third case. And Dad hired you, he asked. He's only paid me half, I said. I'm supposed to keep you alive for one week, during which you'll figure something out. I can't believe this is happening, Zion said. How much did it cost him to hire you? Can't tell you. Client confidentiality, I said. In the meantime, I'm your best friend for the next week. We drove in silence for a few minutes while I circled about to make sure we weren't followed. I can't take you back to your place. Do you have enough money for a hotel? I asked. No, Zion said. My mind raced through several possibilities and finally settled on one. You can sleep on my couch while we figure things out, I said. My attic apartment is in an older suburb in Vegas. My place is the classic bachelor dump. It has two small bedrooms, one room for my office slash file room slash computer room slash junk room, the other for my bedroom. There's a living room crammed with half-eaten pizzas and empty pizza boxes, half-full Chinese takeout boxes, dozens of beer cans and soda cans and old coffee containers. A mess of papers buried the counter, topped with a brochure for an LGBTQ cruise my friends wanted me to go on with them. I don't have laundry hookups, but Grandma lets me use hers. It's in a screened-off porch out back. I know how to do laundry. I just don't have time to do it. Besides, I know which pile is dirty clothes and which one has clean clothes. Hint, the clean clothes are on the couch, while the dirty clothes are on the floor. Zion called his dad, who confirmed everything I had said. Plus Zion asked, Why are they after me? And the loving dad that he was said, In order to get the loan, I told them that you were due to receive a very large inheritance from your grandfather, including his house. 
Damn it, Zion yelled. There was no inheritance. We barely had enough to pay off Grandpa's medical bills and bury him, and you would know that if you were ever around. It was the only way I could get the money, his dad said. I figured with the right hand, I could win enough that you'd never know. It wasn't my fault that my system didn't work. Zion went angry quiet and icily said, So now those people think I have an inheritance that will cover all your debts. They sent people after me, Dad. I didn't expect that, his dad said. We're family, so you have to help me. Does that give you the right to ruin my life? Zion said. I'll get us out of this, his dad said. Maybe I can get your mother to sell her house. Maybe she's got some savings I can use. You don't understand. They could kill me. Mom divorced you and will never help you, Zion said. And right now, I regret even knowing you. While Zion talked to his dad, I cleared off the couch and got out a couple of blankets. Definitely not a five-star hotel. My dump wouldn't even make a half a star. I took a load of clothes down to the washer, made sure Grandma had taken her medication and had gone to bed, then spent five minutes salvaging my kitchenette. I don't have time for chores. Zion made a quick call to his friends in the band. His saxophone was safe. The two men and woman had asked them a lot of questions about Zion, and then had left the club. I found us a couple of clean plates, and served us both a couple of slices of pizza, and found Zion a clean t-shirt and sweatpants to change into. We talked until eleven or so before turning in. Me in the bed, Zion on the couch. I wasn't used to another person in my attic apartment, so I turned the lamp on, got up to get some water, and maybe turn on the TV for some background noise. Hey, Zion said. He was still awake. The couch was a foot too short for him to stretch out, so his bare feet stuck past the armrest. That doesn't look comfortable, I said. He slightly chuckled and sat up. I'm not complaining. Thanks for letting me camp out here tonight. I shrugged and said, Mi messy casa is su messy casa. I went into the small kitchenette, grabbed a water bottle, and when I returned to the living room, Zion stretched his feet and his arms dangling over the edges. He wasn't a big guy, but it was a small couch. I knelt next to the sofa and said, We can be adults about this, right? What do you mean? he asked. I removed the cap from my water bottle and said, The bed. I take the left, you can have the right, and I promise to keep my hands to myself. After all, you're a client, and I want at least a three-star review. Can I get a water bottle too? he asked. Make it a four-star review. Water bottles in the fridge, I said, heading back to the bedroom. Zion took his side of the bed and was asleep instantly. Me? I couldn't sleep. Maybe it had something to do with Philip, because he was the last person other than me in this bed. Or maybe I was nervous because of the situation I was in. Or maybe it was one of those warm Vegas nights. The back of the attic apartment had a small deck. I took my water and walked outside, staring at the sky, staring at the odd barrenness in my life. An odd sense of loneliness surfaced, but didn't disappear. I fell asleep on the deck. I woke with the sun, an odd crick in my neck, ashamed at the mess my place had become. I took another load of laundry down to the wash, transferred last night's laundry to the dryer, and made Grandma a simple breakfast and lined up her medication and then went back upstairs and began washing the dishes. It gave me time to think. It had been four years since I had had a reason to clean up my place. I got busy. It was an hour later that I heard the shower start. Zion would need clean clothes and a clean towel. I left both by the door to the tiny bathroom. It was no wonder I never cleaned. I had more stuff than there were storage spaces. The bathroom door opened and Zion quickly found the towel and clothes. I focused on the dishes rather than his sexy svelte abs before he closed the door to change. I pretended that something exciting was not happening in my gut. I told myself it didn't mean anything. I told myself that getting interested in a guy wasn't worth the trouble. I told myself that short-term relationships are better than long-term ones. 
I told myself all kinds of things, but on some level, I realized they were all lies. My life was comfortable and safe, and I didn't have to worry about long-term relationships. Then I met Zion. He was in trouble. He needed help. Worse yet, he was heart-throbbingly handsome, and I liked being with him. Was he the first person I had brought back to my place since Philip? As I tidied the kitchen, I racked my brain. When was the last time I had brought any man here, especially for something romantic? Was the answer, never? That's why I didn't care if my attic apartment was a mess. Grandma used a walker and never took the steep stairs to visit me, and I had always gone to my date's place or a motel for any one-night stand. After cleaning the frying pan, I cooked up some eggs and some spam and divided them onto plates. Breakfast is ready, I yelled, starting the coffee maker. Out in a minute, Zion yelled back. When he emerged, making my old clothes look stylish, he said, I have classes today, and if I stay here for a week, I need to pick up a few things from my apartment. Odds are, I said, it's being watched. Not a good idea to go there. I'll need my spare saxophone and my textbooks for class, he said and I have a gig tonight back at the Black Orchid. Can you have your roommate meet us at Gordon Gourmet Burgers and bring them? I asked. He grimly smiled and said, I don't have a roommate. We quickly ate, and after I got a quick shower and dressed, I found Zion looking at the brochure for the LGBTQ cruise. He looked up, and I said, A two-week cruise set in the middle of June. Sun, the Caribbean, and a costume bash you won't believe. I went two years ago and had the time of my life. But I'm not exactly rolling in cash. After protecting you for a week, and assuming your dad pays me, I'll have enough money to finish paying for the cruise. Costume party? Zion asked. Come here, I said, and led him back to the bedroom. I pulled out my costume and held it up to me. It was that crazy pirate guy from all the movies. Zion only nodded, but his face grew serious. That disturbed me. And I said, This surprises you? You didn't realize I was gay? No, Zion said, looking about the mess I lived in. We shared a bed and nothing happened, I said. I meant it when I said this is only a job. I'm a professional. If it bothers you that I'm gay, I'll take the couch. Finally, Zion looked at me and quickly hid the smile as he said, you don't live up to the stereotype. Meaning? I asked. You ever heard of the show Queer Eye for the Straight Guy? Ran for five seasons twenty years ago, and then they remade it a few years ago, but I don't know how many seasons it went. It's where gay guys make over a straight man in his home, giving him a bit of style, Zion said. I think I've watched an episode a long time ago, I said. They need to invent a new series. Queer eye for the queer guy, Zion said. You, my heroic protector, are in need of a style intervention. What's wrong with the way I live, I said, stepping back a little. Zion took my costume from me and hung it back in the closet. I'm trusting you with my life. What say you trust me with yours? We will only be together for a week, so what have we got to lose? Besides, if I don't have something to distract me, I'll go crazy. What was I getting myself into? I've never been into style or fashion or looking good. I've always preferred being practical, not a clothes hound, too expensive. Still, it might be fun, as long as it didn't last long. Will it cost a lot? I asked, because I don't have very much. We will invent private detective budget-friendly chic, Zion said. Then he winked at me. Don't worry, I know what I'm doing, but right now I need to get to class. Not without me tagging along, I said. I'll be ready in five. In the daylight, my car was as big a mess and as dirty as my apartment. When had I let it get this bad? Had I stopped caring after Philip had left? Four years ago? The lesson learned from my time with Philip was that only money mattered. And since I didn't have much, I wasn't worth spending time with. 
Had I been battling a weird depression without realizing it? I was living life, but not really living. The saxophone solo Zion had been playing last night ran through my head. Beautiful, a little bit erotic, maybe a little lonely. I surveyed the car. Zion never complained about the mess in my apartment and my car, but he had to have noticed it. Somehow, the car in my attic apartment had become metaphors of my life. Was this who I had turned into once Philip had left? I didn't like the mess I had become. Forget thinking. I have a job to do. On the way to the university, we made a quick stop at Zion's apartment. Painted a light coffee color with light beige accents. Several stylish lamps and accent throws made it cozy. Nice. I said. What I didn't say was that it was stylish and relaxing, and I wish I knew how to live like this. While I kept watch out front, Zion spent five minutes packing a bag and his spare saxophone and music, and a grocery bag with lots of bread and the biggest jar of peanut butter I'd ever seen. As he locked up, a car pulled up. The woman from last night was driving. She saw us pulled out her cell phone, and texted someone. Time to leave, I said. We drove away, but not to any specific place. She wasn't very good at tailing anybody, because it didn't take much to lose her. The second car which joined her, an older black Volvo, followed us everywhere. Down the strip, onto I-15, through random suburbs. I didn't like this. They could easily call ahead and have another car block our way. I began to worry. Once again, I pulled onto I-15, and this time I drove east as if I were going to Utah. You might be a little late to class, I told Zion. I had a little trick that not a lot of people know about. The highway patrol have a turnout about 10 miles east of Vegas, which they can use to scan traffic and find speedsters, or take a break if needed or sneak from the east side of the freeway to the west side of the freeway when they are in a hurry. Step one, I gunned my car, hitting speeds a little too fast. As planned, the other car sped up to keep up with me. Step two, at a certain billboard, and when the other car was going as fast as me, I immediately shifted to the inside emergency lane and slowed down. Their reaction times were a couple of seconds slower, and they shot past me. Step three, take the turnout and wave at the car that was too far ahead to do anything. When we got back to Vegas, we didn't have a tail any longer, but they knew my car, and I bet they knew Zion's car. With no other choice, we went back to my apartment, parked my car into the garage, and took Grandpa's old car a ten-year-old dark gray Toyota Corolla. For a little while, we were anonymous. As we were driving, Zion called his dad and proceeded to call him every name in the book as he told him how we had been followed. Zion's first class was a music theory class. I didn't understand it, but Zion did. The wonder on his face made me smile. His second class was a one-on-one -on -one lesson with Zion practicing and playing several pieces while the teacher critiqued. I sat to the side and listened. The teacher was strict, but knew her stuff. I closed my eyes and enjoyed myself as Zion played, letting the music carry me and, um, don't tell anyone. But I wondered what it would be like to actually have someone in my life. Relationships are stupid. My one big relationship had taught me that there were no happy ever afters. All my little relationships taught me that it's better to keep commitments simple and short term. Besides, I'd only known Zion for a day, and he'd be gone in a week. Definitely not enough time to develop feelings. Except, I think, that maybe I was. Zion worked part-time at the stationery slash card store about a mile from campus. The big question was, did the people his father had taken the loan from know about this place? 
I waited out front as Zion worked, but the black Volvo didn't show up. If his father didn't know where Zion worked, then maybe the other people didn't know either. After his shift ended, we took the things he'd retrieved from his place back to my place. Zion still had to get in a few hours' practice before his show tonight, and unfortunately, the people after him knew about his show. I made sure to carry extra ammunition. Well, Zion practiced, I surveyed my apartment. I didn't know the first thing about style, or about clothes, or about organization. I contrasted my disaster of a place with the nice place Zion lived in. I did the dishes and ran a load of laundry. I also checked on Grandma and made sure she took her medicine and had some dinner. It only took a second to wash her lunch dishes. I went back upstairs to find Zion eating a peanut butter sandwich. At my look, he said, it's for luck. When he took a break from his practicing, Zion walked over to me, took my hand, and led me to the closet. First rule, he said, most people wear only two things out of every ten things. The rest just rot in your closet. That's dumb, I said. It's true. Look at all the clothes in your closet, he said. You never wear those. But look at your clean clothes pile. Those are what you wear all the time. But some of those clothes in the closet cost a lot of money, I said, or were gifts. But they are hanging unused in your closet while the clothes you love are getting walked on, Zion said. Let's reverse that. Let's hang up all the stuff you normally wear and forget the rest. That's insane. Do you want me to throw the rest away? Nope, Zion said. We'll put them in garbage bags and let's see how many things you miss over the next month. I think the answer will surprise you and in the process, we'll discover your own personal style. Once we know that, everything else won't matter because you don't like it. He must have noticed the look I gave him, and he smiled. We're together for a week, so trust me. If you don't like my ideas, you can go back, because nothing will be gone. I loved hearing Zion practice the saxophone. I loved seeing how he could make anything stylish. I hated the way my attic apartment looked. I hated how frumpy I looked. What did I have to lose? I decided to go along with Zion's ideas. Zion made another peanut butter sandwich just before we left. For luck, I asked. He nodded and said, it works, you should try it. When we went back to the Black Orchid, the two men and the lady sat in the back and watched us. They kept their distance. They didn't bother Zion and I, only stared at us. I listened to the music, especially when Zion played, but didn't relax. I loved watching him play music. I loved listening to him. If I'm not careful, I might fall in love with him. As we drove away, they tailed us. I spent 30 minutes driving on random streets before they gave up. Zion called his dad and told him. His dad responded, My system is perfect. I just need some time to prove it. The next day, Zion took me to a salon and they cut my hair and styled it. He picked through my clothes, ironed a couple, and made me look like a million bucks. I think he liked making me his personal Ken doll and dressing me up. I think I liked it too. I kept cleaning my apartment, shaking off the specters of Philip, and creating my space. My own space. Zion taught me about my clothes and helped me in figuring out my style, my own look. I stayed near Zion when he went to school. I was with him when he went to work. I listened as he practiced. I went to his gigs at the Black Orchid. I loved waking up next to him. I loved hearing him breathe during the night. I knew it would be over in a few days, but having a friend, a roommate, was incredibly healing. We had fun together, had fun talking. I told him about Philip, and he told me about his boyfriends. We had an early dinner with Grandma and she liked Zion. Our relationship was casual. It was deep. I loved being with him. He made me happy in a way I hadn't felt for a long time. And because of that, I let down my guard. 
We slept in the same bed. It was late, and we'd been talking. I don't know what came over me, but I inched over, raised his hand, and kissed it. I kissed up his arm, slowly, enjoying every touch. And I had just gotten to his neck when I backed away. I must stay professional. It is my duty. I'm sorry, I whispered. I'll sleep on the couch. How long has it been since you were close to someone? He asked. Doesn't matter, I said. You're my client. The damn couch was too short, so I slept on the floor. Frustrated. Angry at myself. Angry at life. Angry at Philip for betraying me. And somewhere in there, I was very sad, and very lonely, and very afraid. When I woke the next morning, Zion was laying next to me, cuddling me. As I looked at his sleeping face, I realized that maybe, in a strange way, and I'd hardly even wanted to admit it to myself, but I had begun to care about him. It was our fourth night together, and yes, Zion ate another peanut butter sandwich right before we left. We were at the Black Orchid. I was sipping on a whiskey sour, enjoying the light jazz. Soon it would be time for Zion's solo. I couldn't wait. I was so lost in my weird little thoughts that I didn't notice when the two men and the woman entered the club. I didn't notice when they surveyed the crowd. I didn't notice them until they sat down at the table across from me. One of the men smirked as he unbuttoned his jacket. The bartender brought them their drinks. Zion noticed them first. Great bodyguard I am. His music paused for a second, and then, professional that he was, he resumed playing. We were cornered. There was nothing Zion or I could do. The woman reached into her purse and pulled out a cell phone. She looked at Zion and tapped the phone. There was little I can do until the band went on break. I sipped my whiskey sour. Should I go on the attack? Should I grab Zion and run? They obviously wanted Zion to take a phone call. But why? Though my gut churned, I waited. Zion finished his set, carefully set his saxophone on its stand, looked at me with a strange kind of smile, and then joined me. The woman picked up her phone and joined us at our table. She started the conversation by saying, Zion, Marcus, good evening. I have a message for you. Why are you following us? I asked. She almost purred as she slightly chuckled and finally said, Incentive? She activated her phone and a voice said, Zion, is that you? Is Marcus with you? Dad, Zion said. Yes, he is. Are you okay? I had a feeling I wouldn't like what was about to be said. I unbuttoned my jacket so I could easily get to my shoulder holster and my Glock. I wasn't ready for how bad it really was. Zion's dad cleared his throat and said, I told you everything would work out. I won a fortune at the blackjack table, and now I'm paying everybody back. Marcus, thank you for keeping my son safe, but your services are no longer needed. I will pay the rest of our agreement, but consider the other three days a bonus for a job well done. I stopped paying attention. The job was over? There was no reason for Zion to stick around me? All the fun we had these last four days was done. My time with Zion lasted barely longer than a one-night stand. I remained a professional, but the way I felt was not very professional. I had feelings for this man. Strong feelings. Zion, his dad continued, I know I owe you a lot of money and an apology, but as soon as I see you, I'll pay it all back with interest. Suddenly... I felt the mood shift. I was not needed anymore. Dad, Zion said, you have to promise you're not going to gamble again. Let's get you help because I'm not going through this again. 
A moment's pause, and then his dad said, I promise, kiddo. I hope that promise lasts longer than five minutes. For Zion's sake, I sipped my drink, fighting the melancholy that lodged itself in my chest. Why had I expected this to be more than just a job? They finished their call, and I pasted a stoic smile on my face to hide the fact that my heart ached. Now that the job was done, why would Zion want to hang out with style-challenged me? He could do so much better. Have a good evening, the lady said before she returned to her partners. They finished their drinks and left. It was time for Zion to get back on stage. I guess my job is done, I said. As soon as you finish, we can go back to my place. Pick up your stuff, and I can take you back to your apartment. It's been a lot of fun working with you. It has, Zion said. But I hate leaving a job half done. What if when I finish here, we simply go back to your place? I'm not a client anymore. What if I gave you a raving review once we're alone? Zion leaned over and kissed me. My brain exploded with nuclear fireworks. By the weekend, Zion had moved in permanently. Epilogue. About eight in the evening, early June. A year and a couple months later, we had just finished dinner with Grandma before setting out. Our place was a mess because Zion and I had been repainting, and, silly us, we thought we'd be done before today. We'd have to finish when we get back. I was in the shower while Zion set our suitcases by the door. Two weeks of heaven were on the way. We still lived in Grandma's attic apartment, and we both took care of Grandma. The place was small with the two of us, and all our stuff crammed in it. But uh, we didn't mind. It was perfect. The doorbell rang, which was unusual because nobody walked upstairs to see us, and everybody knew we were leaving today. Besides, they always went to Grandma's door thinking that's how to get to us. Unless it was Ian's dad. They'd reconciled over the last year. He was going to drive us to the airport and watch over our place while we were gone. To my knowledge, he hasn't gambled once since he won big. Can you get that, love? I yelled. It's probably your dad. Zion mumbled something like he had a peanut butter sandwich stuffed into his mouth. We went through a lot of peanut butter. As I turned the water off, I heard a very familiar voice. It wasn't Zion's dad. It was my ex, Philip. It must be close to five years since I had heard his voice. Excuse me, didn't Marcus Smith used to live here? Philip asked. Oh, I'm Philip. We used to date. I need to talk to him. I recognized you. Marcus has told me everything. He's even shown me all the pictures, Zion said. That made me chuckle, because Zion helped me burn them. What's with all the suitcases? Did I come at a bad time? Philip asked. Pretty much, Zion said. Marcus and I don't have much time. We have a red-eye flight to catch because we're going on this year's LGBTQ cruise through the Caribbean. I haven't even heard of some of the islands we're visiting. A set of footsteps ran up the stairs to our apartment, and Zion's dad said, Sorry I'm late, guys. Had to put gas in the car. You're just on time. Marcus is getting out of the shower, Zion said. In that case, Zion's dad said, What stuff do you want me to load up? You did pack sunscreen, right? Did you get the pictures back yet? If not, I can pick them up while you're gone. Another week on the pictures, so don't worry, Dad, Zion said. Let's start with the suitcases. Then Philip asked a really dumb question, which I should have expected. Wait a second. Why are you two going on a cruise? What pictures? I quickly dressed. Zion must have showed off his ring, because he said, Our wedding pictures. Then his dad said, I don't mean to be rude, but if we don't get moving, you two will be the only couple in the universe that were late for their honeymoon. The End I'm Gio, author and reader of this piece. Thank you for joining me, my friends. If you'd like to hear more stories about gay men falling in love, stop on my channel. I post a new story every Wednesday. Peace.